This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. Our website is ccc.qbook.tv, where you can find other audio and video episodes with photos, links, and information related to today's conversation. Subscribe to leave comments and access research episodes with applied topics and research reports. During the talk, uh, if anybody is uh, wanting to clarify some particular aspect of the talk, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, uh, raise your hand and ask that question at that time. So, uh, one of the, the things that's driving this research is that there's a tremendous amount of interest in the uh, topic of service productivity. And um, Michael Hammer, the uh, author of Reengineering the Corporation, uh, puts it this way. Increasing service productivity through front office reengineering is the challenge of the decade. And uh, clearly, he's thinking that uh, service uh, productivity is absolutely important for uh, driving the uh, productivity of uh, business in general. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that the, the service part of the economy is such a, a huge part. Uh, in Taiwan, for example, the uh, service economy is about 75% of the economy. So um, one thing that a lot of companies are doing to try to improve uh, productivity in the service sector is uh, to uh, increase uh, the efficiency of service uh, functions to try to cut costs. And we see this in a lot of different ways. Uh, we see this, for example, with uh, telephone menu systems where you, you call up and try to get service from somebody, but you can't talk to a real person. You have to go through these telephone menus and try to somehow uh, get the answer that you want to the service problem that you have. Um, another way that uh, companies are cutting costs and providing service is the Internet itself. And the Internet is um, a very convenient place for people to uh, get uh, answers to questions, to, to get service. Uh, to uh, buy things. Uh, so th this is a, a way that uh, really requires very little labor on the part of the uh, company because once you have the Internet set up, then it doesn't really require that much labor to maintain. Another thing that we see is self-service kiosks. Uh, for example, when I checked in for my flight uh, to uh, come to Taiwan, uh, I checked in at a self-service kiosk uh, where I could get my ticket and uh, uh, there was very little labor involved. The, the only labor that was involved was somebody to check my passport and make sure that I had a passport that was, uh, that was good for coming to Taiwan. Uh, another thing that we see um, more and more, uh, I don't know whether you have this here in Taiwan or not, but... Uh, for example, if you go to a grocery store, uh, you have uh, sometimes in the United States the opportunity to check out yourself. Uh, you, you just uh, use a barcode scanner and uh, check out all your items at the grocery store and then pay for it, and nobody helps you at all. There's, there's nobody checking you out at all. It's, uh, it's totally done by yourself. 
in general, uh, what all these companies are trying to do is they're trying to use less labor and more automation because labor is expensive. And so if they can use less labor and more automation, then that drives costs down, makes things more productive. So looking at this from the standpoint of society, uh, we really have a huge issue here because service is a much bigger part of every economy in the world. And I mean every one. Uh, for example, even, even China, uh, which is traditionally a very labor-based economy, has increased just in the last two or three years from 34% service in the economy to about 40% service as part of the economy. And of course, the big cities in China are already uh, much over 50% in terms of uh, the service economy. And uh, Taiwan, as I said before, is about 74% uh, right now, uh, service as percentage of the economy. The United States is about 80%. Uh, European Union is about 74% as a, a percentage of the economy. So service is really taking over the economy uh, just about everywhere in the world. And yet, we have this big problem that service productivity is lagging goods productivity throughout the, throughout the world. And um, so naturally, governments, uh, businesses, everybody are trying to figure out how can we make service more productive because this is essential for economic growth. Now, one of the problems with this has been pointed out by um, a friend of mine, uh, A. Parasuraman, uh, one of the uh, service gurus in the world. And, um, and, and he said this, while increasing service productivity is a laudable pursuit, especially in the short term, a sole focus on it can be counterproductive in the long term. So he's quite worried about people emphasizing service productivity too much and producing bad results in the long term. Uh, my own research uh, has indicated that there is a trade-off between the level of service provided and productivity. Uh, in a study that uh, I did with um, uh, Gene Anderson and Klaus Fornell from the University of Michigan, uh, we studied uh, a lot of companies in Sweden and um, collected a, a lot of data with respect to their productivity, uh, their uh, customer satisfaction levels, and their financial performance of their companies. And what we found out was that uh, the level of service provided as measured by customer satisfaction and the productivity level that was achieved um, are usually at cost purposes. And what I mean by that is we found that in the, in, the, in the service sector, if you have high productivity and also drive high customer satisfaction levels, you're not going to have good profitability. Um, on the other hand, if you have a uh, high um, customer satisfaction level, but not such good productivity, you have the opportunity to make good profits. Or uh, vice versa, if you have a low customer satisfaction level and high productivity, you have the opportunity to have good profits. So uh, there's this trade-off. And interestingly enough, that trade-off is not seen in the good sector. In the good sector, if you have a high productivity level and a high customer satisfaction level, those often go together to produce good profitability results. And so uh, what we're finding is, is something uh, very different in the service sector. And um, so if you're trying to uh, think about what, what kind of companies really make money in, in the service sector, uh, they're, they're really characterized by these two pictures here on this, uh, on this screen. 
Uh, the one on the left is a fast food restaurant. Very high productivity. Very poor service. But um, that's one way to make money. Drive your costs way down. Provide very fast, efficient service. And um, just do a lot of volume. The uh, picture on the right is a very fancy restaurant. And um, there it's uh, entirely different. Uh, they're not trying to drive costs down. Their costs are high. They provide lots of labor. You can see the, the waiter standing over the table providing labor for, for this uh, service uh, experience. So uh, very low productivity, high costs, but very high customer satisfaction level. And that's another way to make money. Okay, hopefully I can make this work, but uh, I want to show uh, kind of a, a hopefully funny example of uh, what uh, some customers are putting up with now in terms of uh, increasing uh, productivity. So I want to show you a uh, situation where um, we have a uh, self-service situation at the grocery store. Somebody's trying to check himself out at the grocery store. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so some customers are getting unhappy about this. Um, we're uh, having a situation where sometimes the uh, self-service is very frustrating, and this is causing more and more concerns for people. So um, what we want to do in this study is uh, we want to uh, separate long-term service productivity from shorter medium-term uh, productivity. And... Um, uh, first of all, I want to I want to uh, mention that this study is uh, one that is uh, published right now in the Marketing Science Institute Working Paper series, and that's the particular uh, paper that I'm presenting here today. Uh, we have another version that's slightly different that's um, that we're not going to be presenting, but. I want to talk about uh, this particular study because it talks about short-term and long-term effects, which I think are interesting. Our second contribution is to demonstrate that an optimal level of service productivity exists. Uh, and what I mean is it's probably a mistake to try to increase your productivity as much as possible, which a lot of companies are currently trying to do. Third contribution, we want to explore the factors that make optimal service productivity higher or lower. In other words, try to figure out what is it that makes the optimal service productivity level uh, very high, we should have high productivity, or very low, we should have low productivity. What are the things that, uh, that drive that? And then, finally, we want to provide some guidance to service executives. Now, what kind of advice would we give them about productivity? So our approach is really to produce testable propositions based on a formal theory and analytical modeling. So we're building a formal analytical model and deriving these pro propositions. And these propositions can then be tested on actual data. So the second part is empirical data analysis using over 700 companies from two different time periods as we wanted to make sure that our effects were robust to uh, time period. Okay, now the definition of uh, service productivity, which I promised a while back. Our definition is, uh, of course, in general, any productivity is output divided by input. 
So the question is, what output are you looking at and what input are you looking at? So in this particular case, we're looking at labor productivity, which in this case is dollar sales. We're running this in the United States, so we're in dollars. Dollar sales divided by number of employees. And uh, if we have a uh, set wage rate, then service productivity is the same as um, dollar sales divided by labor cost. So we'll sometimes be using that in our formal modeling. So here's, um, here's the theoretical framework in sort of its broadest version. Uh, what we have is um, uh, covariates or moderators of optimal service productivity. That's down in the lower left-hand box down there. Um, and that drives the optimal labor uh, intensity versus automation, which is the, the big... Um, Maybe I can actually point this out here, see if this works. Okay, there we go. Uh, the, uh, the, the covariates or, okay, sorry. The covariates or moderators of optimal service productivity drive the optimal labor intensity versus automation, which is the big um, decision that the companies need to make in terms of how, how much productivity they intend to have. Um, that, um, results in an optimal service productivity level that the, the company should have. But um, we, we notice that uh, the companies, of course, are not always going to be exactly at optimum. Uh, they'll often have an actual uh, labor intensity that may differ, and um, that results in an actual service productivity level. And uh, the uh, relationship between the actual service productivity level and the optimal service productivity level uh, results in a financial return. But we're also taking a look at some uh, covariates of financial return because, of course, the uh, service productivity issue is not the only thing that uh, drives financial return. So we want to uh, also uh, have some covariates that we control for. All right, we have um, a number of assumptions that we, um, that we, we use. Uh, first assumption, the wage rate, the cost of automation, and the level of technology are fixed in the market in the short run and are known to the firm. Uh, this is fairly realistic because um, typically a firm really has a price of labor so, for example, if you're a fast food restaurant, there's a certain amount you're going to have to pay to get an employee to go work there. And uh, that's uh, something that's really outside your control in the short run. Um, likewise, the, the cost of automation is going to be uh, pretty much fixed. For example, if you want to put in a computer system that, uh, that uh, helps uh, provide your service for you, uh, that the amount you pay is pretty much fixed in the short run. The, the second assumption, A2, uh, the firm chooses its relative usage of labor versus automation in delivering service so as to maximize its financial return operationalized here as the discounted uh, profit flows that we get from the customers. So, uh, you know, if you're the fast food restaurant, you may want to have uh, self-service kiosks where people can order their food, or you may want to have people taking orders at a counter. And that's, that's a decision that the restaurant needs to make. The uh, third assumption, A3, attraction and retention are both affected by the previous uh, service level. In other words, people observe the service level that's being provided by the, the company, and uh, that affects whether they uh, choose to, um, to be a customer of that company. You know, if, if, uh, if the company is perceived as providing good service, then you attract and retain more customers. The fourth assumption, A4, uh, automation is cheaper than labor per unit of service. 
And, and this is, of course, the, the classic um, reason why companies automate in the first place. They want to automate because that's going to drive their costs down. So, for example, the telephone menu systems, the self-service kiosks, uh, the Internet um, service uh, capabilities, these are all done because they drive costs down. The fifth assumption, A5, quality increases as the amount of labor uh, per unit of service increases. So, for example, if, if you're a fancy restaurant and you want to have one wait person for a room that serves 100 guests, that's very bad service probably because everybody's going to be waiting a long time for service. On the other hand, if you have a wait person for every table, that's tremendous service, but it's probably very costly. So our model set up, uh, we have a firm that's joined in progress. In other words, it's an ongoing firm. Uh, we have a two-period model that we set up where the first period is the current period. The company's making decisions about how to, how to do things in the current period. And the second period represents the future. So we want to get the, the uh, future impact of our service productivity decisions. So here's some of the uh, formal development of the model. Uh, the labor cost per unit is theta w, where, uh, where uh, w is a, uh, a wage rate that's, uh, that's set up by the uh, market. And theta is the amount by, uh, by which you use labor. In other words, if theta is 1, you're using all labor. If theta is 0, you're using no labor. Um, so uh, as you can see, theta down there is defined as labor intensity. The higher theta is, the more labor you're using to provide your service. The automation cost, then, is 1 minus theta times A, where A is the automation cost per unit that's set by the market, and 1 minus theta is the amount of service per unit that you're using, that, that you're supplying by automation. So you can see um, that if theta is 1, you're using all labor and, and no automation. If theta is 0, you're using no labor and all automation. Then uh, productivity can be uh, set up as um, uh, QR divided by Q theta W, um, where uh, QR is just the, uh, the uh, amount of uh, income that you get, where Q is the uh, sales and R is the uh, price per unit. And... Um, the, the denominator is the, uh, the total labor cost that you're, that you're uh, doing, which is Q times theta times W. Theta W being the labor cost per unit, Q being the number of units. So uh, then dividing that out, you can see that it's a very simple expression for the productivity level, which is R divided by theta W. So the, uh, the other key element here is the uh, service level. You know, how good is the service that's being supplied? And here we set that up as theta plus alpha times 1 minus theta, where alpha is the uh, level of technology, the, the efficiency of the technology. So if alpha is 1, for example... That says that the technology, the automation technology, is just as effective at, at supplying service as labor is. If alpha equals zero, that says automation is useless and, and does nothing to provide service. But typically, of course, alpha is going to be somewhere between zero and one, meaning it's not quite as good probably as labor, but maybe it's not that much worse. So this is um, a simple expression for the service level in terms of the um, uh, in terms of theta, the uh, the amount by which we actually automate. 
and use automation instead of labor. So putting all this together, the uh, period one profit can be expressed as, as this. It's uh, uh, MR, that's the amount of um, contribution that we get per unit, where R is the price, M is the margin, uh, minus uh, theta W, which is the amount that we're spending for labor for each unit, minus 1 minus theta times A, which is the amount that we're spending uh, on automation for each unit. And of course, all that is multiplied by Q, the number of units. So that uh, produces the expression there on the second row, uh, which is our profit uh, in period one expression. We also want to um, make sure that we uh, include the idea that service can drive retention and attraction. Because remember I said we want to set this up such that uh, we have more sales if we uh, have better service. So the retention rate, R, is set up as beta times S, where S is the service level. So in other words, um, and this is for, for a positive beta, so um, as the service level increases, uh, the uh, retention rate increases. And um, uh, substituting for S, the service level, on the right side, uh, we get that expression in terms of, uh, in terms of alpha and theta uh, from, the, the previous, uh, from the previous slides. And uh, we do a similar thing for uh, attraction. Attraction, again, is a function of the service level. So uh, gamma is the uh, degree to which the service level drives um, attraction, new, new customer attraction. And again, we substitute for S the service level uh, to, to get this um, in terms of also alpha and theta. So, um, so here we have expressions that tell us what kind of uh, sales we're going to get from attraction and uh, then also the degree to which we're going to retain our existing customers, the retention rate. So um, taking this into account, uh, we have our second period profit, um, which is P2 here. And, um, and, and here we have, the, um, um, we have a, a retention uh, component, which is the, the, first, um, um, the, the first terms in this. And then we have an attraction component, which is the thing out to the, the right on the second row. And... Um, then if we want to consider this in terms of discounted uh, cash flows, uh, that's just uh, P1 plus KP2, where K is a discounting factor. So then, of course, I could uh, then take those expressions and multiply them all out if I wanted to. But I think I'll just leave it as P1 plus KP2 for now. So uh, the manager's um, profit maximization problem is this. The, the manager wants to maximize the financial return, and this is the discounted profit over time, with respect to the degree of labor per unit, um, and, and that's theta. So the manager is really choosing a theta level that maximizes financial return. And um, this, is, this is exactly the, the same thing. It's, uh, it's equivalent to uh, maximizing the uh, financial return with respect to the service productivity level because the uh, theta, the degree to which the firm automates, determines the service productivity level. So um, here's, um, here's what we um, end up finding here. If we do the, uh, the calculus, I'm not going to show the details of all that, but um, if the result of this is that uh, we, we set theta equal to 1 if theta star is greater than or equal to 1, where theta star is that expression down below. We set theta equal to 0, and don't use any labor, if, um, if theta star is less than or equal to 0. 
And otherwise, if it's in the 0 to 1 range, we'll set theta equal to theta star. So we have an expression here for the optimal level of, uh, of uh, uh, labor versus automation. And of course, once we have our optimal level of, um, of labor versus automation, this, this translates to an optimal service productivity level. So, if, for example, uh, if we're in the zero to one range with uh, theta star, then the optimal service productivity level can be uh, written as R divided by W times theta star. And um, we also note that um, as the optimal uh, degree of labor increases, the optimal productivity level declines. Okay, now all that's all well and good, but you're saying, what the heck does all this mean? Well, what are all these equations anyway? Why do we care about any of that stuff? And uh, fortunately, I do have answers for that. So uh, bear with me here a little bit. I'm going to um, now investigate what it is that's going to drive that uh, service productivity level up or down, the optimal productivity level. Now... Um, I'm not going to show the mathematics behind all this. This is all derivations that are in the paper. Uh, but here are the results of the derivations. And I think there's some pretty interesting results. Proposition one, as the profit margin increases, the optimal productivity level decreases. Okay, think about that. As the margin increases, the optimal productivity level decreases. Proposition two, as price increases, the optimal productivity level decreases. Proposition three, if we weight the future more, the optimal productivity level decreases. Proposition four, as the extent to which service drives retention increases, the optimal productivity level decreases. Proposition five, as wages rise, optimal productivity level increases. Proposition six, if wages are cheap enough, as automation costs decrease, the optimal productivity level increases. Now, now some of this is, uh, you would find extremely intuitive. For example, proposition five, uh, as wages rise, optimal productivity increases. Well, why is that? Think about it. It's because... Uh, if labor is expensive, you probably want to use less of it. And therefore, you're going to try to find ways to increase your productivity by substituting more automation for labor. Proposition seven is the level of technology increases, optimal productivity increases. Proposition eight, as initial sales increase, optimal productivity increases. Proposition nine, for a given level of technology, there's an optimal productivity level. Proposition nine is probably the key proposition in this whole thing because what it's saying is that you have a level of productivity that's not infinite, that's the best. It means that if you are trying to increase your productivity to as high an extent as you can, you're making a mistake. Proposition 10, too myopic a viewpoint, boosts short-term productivity and profitability at the expense of overall financial return. In other words, it costs you uh, customer satisfaction and retention and future profits. And we also have something to say about recessions and economic downturns. Proposition 11 says in a recession, uh, I would translate this as an economic downturn instead of recession. Probably that would be more precise because uh, we can be coming out of a recession and still be at a very low point. In a recession, the firm should make relatively more use of labor as opposed to automation than usual. 
and the optimal level of service productivity will be lower than usual. So think about what companies often do in a recession. The first thing they'll do is just fire a whole bunch of people and try to drive their productivity up. And what we're saying is they should be slower to do that. Now, uh, looking at this uh, pictorially in terms of uh, how we expect this to play out over time, um, remember that one of the propositions is about the technology level. And it's saying that as the technology level increases, the optimal productivity level should also increase. So the, the first thing, the thing on the left over here, is really a um, is the the optimal situation uh, to begin with at time one. This is um, before the technology improves. Okay, now as technology improves over time, uh, the uh, the curve changes to this one over here, this red one, uh, because technology has advanced. And uh, what our model says is that this, this should imply an optimal level of productivity that's higher than before. Now, all that is theory. And uh, you might say, well, maybe, uh, maybe those assumptions, even though they're reasonable, uh, maybe they abstract the problem too much, and maybe it's not real. So what we really need to do is we need to take this theory, and we need to test it with empirical data. So that was the next step in our model. So we built an empirical model that could test most of the propositions from our uh, original uh, theoretical model. And, and here it is, the empirical model. Uh, we have uh, financial return there, um, which is a function of, here we have the uh, productivity level, P sub I, or P sub J rather, minus the optimal productivity level, op J, um, squared. Now, what that is seeing is that uh, as we're um, further away from the optimal productivity level, we would anticipate that we would get worse financial return. And that would be true if this delta 1 parameter turned out to be positive. If the delta 1 parameter turned out to be negative, um, then basically it's saying uh, you should get as high a productivity level as you can because uh, that's going to be maximized when the productivity level is infinite. So. This uh, delta 1 really provides a uh, direct test of our proposition that there's an optimal productivity level. And then here we have uh, some covariates for um, financial return. And uh, these, are, these are just control variables, really. Now, um, the, the other part of this model that's very uh, important is the moderators of optimal productivity because uh, the theoretical model said there were a whole lot of different variables that affected what the optimal productivity level should be. So we set that up uh, over here. The optimal productivity level is a function of these moderator variables xij and uh, the, the betas there are just the coefficients on those. And so plugging that into the financial return expression from the previous slide, we end up with this expression, which is the thing that we end up um, actually estimating. This is uh, financial return is um, delta naught minus uh, delta 1. Uh, and here's where we plugged in for optimal uh, productivity level. We just plugged in the, the, the moderators right there. And um, then uh, these are the uh, covariates for financial return from uh, the previous slide. Uh, now, uh, this is obviously quite nonlinear, but uh, we can use nonlinear estimation methods to estimate this and get our, 
get the estimates for all of our coefficients. So the coefficients to be estimated are the delta naught, delta one, uh, these betas, and uh, and these coefficients on the covariates for financial return. So we've, we've got a bunch of uh, things to uh, to estimate. So propositions one, two, five, and nine have very direct tests uh, using the model coefficients. Um, then we have some propositions that are not directly testable, but, but can be tested indirectly. For example, proposition number three, as the future is weighted more, optimal productivity decreases. Well, when is the future going to be weighed a lot? Well, we might argue that the future is going to be weighed a lot if the growth rate is high. So for example, if you're in a market that's growing 80% a year, uh, then the future is very, very valuable to you compared to the present. On the other hand, if your market is declining uh, by 50% a year, probably you're going to want to get your money now because there's not going to be much money later. So here we're using growth rate as a proxy. Higher growth rate means more weight on the future. Uh, proposition four is another one. As the extent to which service drives retention increases, optimal productivity decreases. Well, we, we don't have any uh, direct uh, measures of uh, the degree to which service drives retention. But uh, what, we, what we can use is market concentration, because we can get that information very readily. So if we use market concentration as a proxy, uh, we should think that as the market's more concentrated, service doesn't drive retention as much. And the reason is there's not as many competitors. So if you uh, make your customers angry, they have fewer places to go. Uh, proposition six and seven. Um, six, if wages are cheap enough as automation costs decrease, optimal productivity increases. Well, we might want to say, uh, how do we know what automation costs are? Again, there's not really a uh, convenient measure for that. But we do know that automation costs are decreasing over time. Proposition seven, as the level of technology increases, optimal productivity increases. Again, we don't have a nice, convenient measure of the level of technology. But again, we know that as time is advancing, the level of technology is advancing. So for both of these propositions, we can really use time as a proxy. As time advances, uh, optimal productivity should increase. Both of these would imply. Proposition number eight, as initial sales increase, optimal productivity increases. Well, uh, initial sales is really sort of a matter of how big the company is to start out. And um, one uh, proxy for that is how old the company is. So for example, if you're a brand new startup and hardly have any sales yet, then um, your firm age is going to be low and uh, your initial sales are going to be low also. Whereas if you have a company that's been in business for 100 years, chances are its, its initial sales are higher. Okay, the the uh, data that we used uh, were obtained from CompuStat North America. And uh, we uh, took a look at all service firms with NAICS codes of 42 to 92. So basically, this is a very broad spectrum of service companies in the United States. And um, any firms with missing data were removed from our data set. And uh, uh, this left us with 741 firms for the year 2002 and 751 firms for the year 2007. So it's still quite a, quite a number of uh, firms here. Measures that we used uh, for financial return, we used ROA, return on assets. And that's net income divided by total assets. And the reason for that is that it's a, um, a profitability measure that is scaled by the size of the company. The bigger the company is, the more the assets. And so you, uh, this puts big companies and small companies on the same basis. 
our labor productivity measure was the log of dollar sales divided by number of employees. Uh, profit margin was net sales divided by gross sales. Price was selling cost divided by one minus the profit margin. Growth rate is uh, change in sales divided by the previous sales. Market concentration is the HHI index. The wage rate is the labor expenses per employee in the company. And the firm age is the number of years uh, since it entered the CompuStat data set. So all these are pretty non-controversial. These are uh, definitions that have been used by many authors in the past. So for, for estimation, uh, all variables are Windsorized. We normalized within industry and standardized all the variables. So again, we're trying to control as much as we can for differences across industry. And we're trying to get rid of uh, big outliers, the effects of big outliers. And uh, then uh, the estimation method used was nonlinear least squares estimation with a Gauss-Newton iteration procedure. So uh, those of you who are in the back row won't be able to read this very well. But uh, this is the, uh, the results of the uh, analysis. And um, what you probably can see, even from the back row, is a whole bunch of asterisks on all these things. Basically, the more asterisks it has, the more significant the effect is. And so you can see that basically just about everything is really, really significant and in the expected direction. I think that's the, the big picture that we uh, want to uh, put across here. And uh, of particular importance, the uh, delta 1 parameter, which needed to be positive if, if uh, in fact, it's better to have an optimal productivity level rather than trying to drive productivity as high as possible, uh, that um, actually is significantly positive at the 0.001 level for both data years. So that was, uh, that was something that we were very interested to see. Um, so summary of findings, uh, for profit margin, um, our hypothesis was uh, supported for both data years. In fact, all of the hypotheses, all the propositions uh, were supported for both data years with one exception, and that was the, uh, the firm age variable, which was supported in one of the data years but not supported in the other one. Another thing that we did was to uh, take a look to see whether there was any difference between big firms and small firms in terms of how they were, were dealing with their productivity levels. And so we calculated uh, the productivity level divided by the optimal productivity level. So if the firm was doing this exactly right, according to our model, that quantity would be equal to 1 because productivity and optimal productivity would be exactly the same. So uh, what we found out instead was for big firms, productivity on average was systematically too high in both data years. And for small firms, uh, the pattern is not uh, consistent. Um, in one data year, it was a little bit too high. In another year, data year, it was a little bit too low. So the consistent finding that we have is for big firms. We believe that big firms, on average, are systematically too productive. And, and we might ask, why is that? And uh, one reason that that might be is that uh, the people making decisions about these productivity levels are top managers. And the top managers often have financial um, incentives set up such that short-term profitability is driving their bonuses. And if short-term profitability is driving their bonuses, they're going to want to drive up short-term profits, and that's really at the expense of um, long-term sales. And, and one way to drive up short-term profits is to increase costs right, or decrease costs right away. You can decrease costs very fast. All you have to do is fire a bunch of people. It takes a little bit more time and trouble to increase future sales. 
So if you're a manager, you can you can uh, increase your current profits much easier than you can increase your future profits. So our uh, theoretical contributions, um, I think, are uh, pretty Im important. One is that there's an optimal level for service productivity. Uh, our our uh, theoretical analysis, our, our theoretical model, indicates that, and our empirical analysis confirms it, that, the, in fact, firms should be seeking an optimal level of productivity and not just trying to increase productivity as much as possible. Another thing is that um, the effects over time of service productivity are important. In other words, the ability to uh, attract and retain customers, future customers, based on our service levels today uh, is an important aspect. Another contribution theoretically is that we are extending the theory of the relationship between satisfaction and productivity. And, um, and basically, our findings, I believe, are quite consistent with earlier research, which is that there is this trade-off, and we need to be careful about managing it. Our managerial implications are, um, are very um, direct, I think. One is that it's possible to be too productive. You know, we might put in too many of those phone systems and too many of those kiosks and and we may need to want to consider how quickly we want to do that. Uh, second ma major managerial implication is that large companies are tending to be too productive and should instead uh, increase their service level beyond where it is right now. So big companies are supplying services not as good as it should be and are too productive. They need to give up some productivity and um, satisfy their customers better. That's what this says. Third managerial implication, uh, too myopic a viewpoint leads to too much productivity at the expense of future performance. Also, higher profit margins should mean lower productivity. Higher prices should mean lower productivity. More weight on the future should mean lower productivity. And this last one really means a lot to me because if I take a look at what's happening in the business world in terms of how much companies are weighing the future versus the present, uh, really there's very good reason to believe that companies should be weighing the future more now than they used to. And the reason for that is that companies have the ability to manage customer relationships much more than they ever have. So you have things like customer relationship management uh, that has come on very, very big. Um, and to the, to the extent that we're interested in driving the relationship, we're really driving uh, future sales and not just current sales, not just uh, thinking about transactions in the current period. We're thinking about uh, trying to cross-sell, we're trying to build relationships, we're trying to build future sales. So what I'm suggesting is that this means that companies should be putting more weight on the future as time goes by because technology is making it possible to have deeper customer relationships. And that means that there should be lower productivity, all other things being equal, over time. So companies should be giving this even more consideration. As service has more of an effect on retention, productivity should be lower. In general, the more important the customer is, uh, the more uh, impact service has, etc., the, the more labor should be used and the less productivity should be emphasized. As wages are higher, productivity should be higher. Uh, that just makes sense. If labor is expensive, you want to use less of it. As automation is cheaper, productivity should usually be higher. And that makes sense also. Uh, as automation becomes cheaper, you're going to want to use more of it. As technology advances, productivity should be higher. 
As initial sales are higher, for example, if the company's in a more mature market or it has higher market share, then productivity should be higher. So mature industry companies should be thinking more about productivity, whereas uh, companies that are in growth industries should be thinking less about productivity and more about uh, driving uh, their service level up. And finally, in an economic downturn, productivity should be lower. So our conclusions, first of all, don't always try to increase productivity. It's, uh, it's not a good thing to do. There's an optimal level. Companies should try to find what that optimal level is. In many cases, lower productivity is actually more profitable and leads to happier customers. And there are some happy customers right there. So thank you very much. This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. Our website is ccc.qbook.tv where you can find other audio and video episodes with photos, links, and information related to today's conversation. Subscribe to leave comments and access research episodes with applied topics and research reports.